you know, when we plan. Thanks for joining everyone. We're going to get talking about the crazy world that is the Amazon jungle. When we started talking about this, um, literally like way early in the year, we knew that things would pop up, but man, did we time this webinar, right? These new fees are crazy. Um, so we are definitely going to get into some of that today. Overall, though, this is a conversation on selling on Amazon profitably. Um, we have our panel of experts here, and we'll have them uh, just quickly introduce themselves. Lisa, do you want to get started with us first? Yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Pauline. Um, my title is too long. Gatita got cut off on the little image on the screen, but that's okay. I have it above me here. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Kinski. I am the Marketing and Partnerships Manager at Gatita, and we are the global leader in Amazon FBA auditing and reimbursements for sellers worldwide. So I saw that we had Rosanna calling in from Argentina. We can help you out there as well, love. Um, but what we're doing is we're helping sellers to get the most back in reimbursement available to them, ultimately helping their business become more profitable. So I will, I will leave it at that. Cheers. Awesome. Scott, introduce yourself, please. Tell the world uh, about it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Scott Scharf. Um, I am currently the, the founder of Scharf Consulting, where I provide e-commerce sellers business optimization processes uh, to really optimize their business, coach them, solve their accounting finance uh, challenges and optimize that, optimize their operations, review their tech stack. Um, I was the co-founder of Catch and Clouds, the first e-commerce accounting firm back in 2011. So I've been deeply involved in this e-commerce space for many, many times, have great relationships, but my core is really how do I solve these back, off bus back office business and technology challenges process challenges uh, of running these crazy e-commerce businesses, which of course, Amazon makes more and more challenging on a regular basis. Keeping us on our toes. Yes, Scott. Thanks. Great to have you here. Uh, Liz, for anyone who may not know you, I know that's like <laughs> an impossibility. Just in case, uh, please uh, introduce yourself to the, to the team here. Hi, I'm Liz Downing. I'm the director of partnerships at the Ecom Cooperative. I've been in the e-commerce world since about 2014. Started out freelance writing. I worked at Ecom Engine. I worked at Take a Metrics. I've landed at the Ecom Cooperative. And what we are is sort of a, a hub of connection and learning, connecting the merchant community to the service provider community. And we do events, online events. We do in-person events. And I'm having an absolute blast. But I'm happy to be here today. Pauline and I have known each other for a really long time. So Pauline, why don't you tell if anybody doesn't know you? Because I think you know more people than I do. I don't know. I don't know. But that sounds fun. We should just host a party, Liz. Uh, hey, everyone. Pauline from Finale. Great to be here with you today. Um, as you may hopefully already know, Finale helps sellers manage their inventory. Beyond that, we help manage the warehouse. Beyond that, we're really here to make sure that your business can grow and scale. Um, I know it's a lot about like the boxes and the counts and the numbers on your sales channels. That's kind of the 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 basics for what we do. But really, long term strategy is making sure that your business has the capability, has the data to make the right decisions as an operational hub in e-commerce for multi-channel, omni-channel, what have you. Uh, we have the software and we also have a really solid team to help you with questions that you may have, how to set up your business, how to set up your warehouse workflows, how to just manage, you know, candidly, partners, decisions, uh, reporting. So um, that's it today. Hopefully you guys can see that we have experts from across different areas of e-commerce, just that we can talk about profitability on Amazon from a myriad of ways. Um, we are gonna be talking about a lot of different things. And so um, this is just kind of a sample of what we'll talk about. Real quick housekeeping. Yes, this webinar will be recorded. So um, you know, take a couple of quick notes, but know that you'll have it to follow up and really listen in on, share with your team. Our goal here is that you walk away with at least one, if not you know, a couple handful of really good tips to help you, your business, your team, et cetera. So, all right, here we go, crew. Um, on this list, I mean, I know that we've talked about low inventory. Do we wanna get started there or do we wanna kind of kick off with something else? Any ideas from the uh, participants? You can chat in. We also have the Q&A. Um, how about this? I will start off on low inventory fee 
If you see anything on the screen, you guys, anything in particular, this is a webinar for you, for our listeners. So we um, want to know what's on your mind and we're going to do our best to inform you about it. All right, so here we go. Low inventory fee. We have heard a lot about this from variety, again, all angles. And so why it's here, clearly Amazon's grown really big and it needs a better way to mitigate the disruptions to their workflows internally when sellers are falling low in stock. And so as of this month, lucky us, April Fool's, April 1, not a joke, um, there are new fees applied to when stock on your ASINs fall below a 28-day period, uh, a month's period. So they look at it two ways. They look at your inventory at 28 days. They look at your inventory at 90 days. And here's the key. If both of those periods, data point A, data point B, are below a 28-day span, then you'll get that fee charged per the remaining items shipped out in that period, okay? The calculation is there. And then as it relates to kind of seeing a real life example, here's how this goes. And hopefully you can see this. Um, it's just showing you on the top, it's that long-term 90 day. The bottom is the short-term kind of 28 day calculation. And you'll see that at the bottom at 17 and a half days, the top portion is 42 days, right? And so what that means is because your short-term historical daily stock level is under your 28-day span, however, your long-term over 90 days based on sales velocity and the calculation is over, you will not get charged. The fee applies when both calculations fall to under a 28-day period, okay? And so we're talking about these fees. What are the fees? This is how the fees work. So again, not a surprise. It's based on the kind of weight calculation. And per the day of the formula is how you will get charged for those remaining shipped units as they are shipped out. Okay. So again, quick summary, going back to this previous slide, you will only get charged if both of these calculations fall below the 28 day, four week advance period, these are the fees. Okay, great. So now we know what we're talking about. What are other things for you to know? It is calculated at the parent ASIN level. So if you have variations, right, laddering up to it, the parent ASIN, your ASIN, is where this calculation takes, takes place, okay? Um, as we also know, there are other fees coming into play, as in the uh, storage utilization fee. So to manage your inventory well, you have to make sure that it's over 28 days worth of inventory, but under the five months, because that's how you're going to mitigate your costs in this storage utilization fee. When we talk about like the um, the IPI, like your inventory levels and where they need to be set to, that's the sweet spot. 28 days to technically it's like 4.8 months when you work out kind of the exact weeks and days, okay? Um, this fee is not charged to new professional sellers uh, for their first year, new to FBA parent products, okay? That's key, great. For the first 180 days, you do need to be enrolled and get uh, apply and get accepted to the FBA new selection program, but at least there's a way to get around it. So know that there's that. Um, and then also, again, something new, the new AWD, Amazon Warehousing and Distribution, sellers who go through that program will also not feel this fee. Okay, that's a lot. Guys, I swear there's a little bit of good news here, okay? The good news here is that this is likely going to make mean more market share for you in Amazon. Arbitrages right now are like freaking out for what this means to their business. And so for serious sellers who are living in Amazon and not just like, you know, sending random amounts of random SKUs in, that'll that'll kind of hopefully clear them up. Other thing, we talked about those storage utilization fees. 
the good news is that they're reduced actually during peak selling times. So yes, there are more fees coming on, but they're also helping in these reduced fees during non-peak season times. Um, also, again, we talked about where fees won't be applied. Without that 28 days of history, without with those new parent ASINs, you can test products. You can see what the velocity is. Once it makes it over those 28 days of history, then you're getting into the time frame where Amazon can kick it in. Clearly, we need a 28-day history log and a 90-day history log, but that's kind of when you know. The 28 days is when it starts clocking at Amazon, and you have until 90 days to figure out your velocity. So it does give you a little bit of buffer time to figure out how are things moving, check that historical sales velocity um, rate in your seller center account, and then you can just ship things in quickly to get ahead of it at the 90 days, okay? Uh, that's kind of that fourth bullet point. And then again, another way to mitigate this fee, stay on top of your supply chain, know your timelines to get things into your warehouse and into Amazon, and you can do something to get away from this fee. Um, within Finale ourselves, you know, we've, I think you guys know, we provide that order velocity rate. It is a total multi-channel um, rate. And so Amazon's factored in your web store, Shopify, whatever, your Square, your POS. So the good news is that we should have even kind of more buffer time built in because we're not just looking at Amazon. We can, but we're not like, you know, in, in one go. And so that gives you even more time, all right? Um, all right, so hopefully that kind of clears the air a little bit on, on the low inventory fee. Please feel free to ask questions, chat them in, et cetera. Um, but let's get to some other components here. All right, team. Um, again, feel free to chat in anything specific you want to talk about. Um, but if we want to kind of change things up a little bit, uh, why don't we go ahead and, uh, I mean, Liz, Scott, you guys have had discussions before, I know, on these long-term storage fees. How are sellers able to really, again, like know what they're up against, be proactive? Proactivity is always the name of the game. Avoid the storage fees. I mean, it, sorry, go ahead, Liz, up to you. Well, I'll just say that the whole reason Amazon created the inventory performance index was so that that was a metric that you took care of. So like Pauline said earlier, if your IPI score is in the green, then you're likely doing a good job of sell through. You're likely doing a good job of not having too terribly aged inventory. You're likely you know, on the right track. But how do you do that? I think Scott can probably speak to that a little better, but keeping your eye on that little bar and making sure you're doing the things that you need to do. And it's all goes into what Scott's specialty is, which is introducing operational efficiency into your business. So Scott, take it away. <laughs> so, I mean, in some ways, you know, Amazon brings on these fees and everybody kind of needed, you know, depending on what your cycle of purchasing, you need to adapt your purchasing or adapt how much you have onshore, how much do you have in your own staging warehouse, and then how much do you push through the Amazon AWD warehouses if you want to do that. So all of a sudden, there's another layer to your supply chain on top of all the other supply chain challenge of which vendors and is your product going around Africa now, or is it stuck in the Panama Canal? And there's so many things the idea is that when these changes happen, you want to take a step back and see how much does it impact you. But Amazon, like Liz said, is really kind of driving you towards kind of the certain level of efficiency that they want, but it, it applies to the same efficiency you want at Amazon, that you've got the right amount of stock of the right products that turn over uh, in a reasonable time frame, um, and that you don't have product that's just sitting there costing you more and more and the highest cost isn't your staging warehouse. It's not the AWD, which is another lower cost. It's going to be when it's sitting out at Amazon FBA and if it's not turning over and you've got to make even harsher decisions about when do you remove or dispose products. So the idea is you've just got to think about this, draw your own picture, think about your impacts and then decide how you're going to manage it. 
Yeah. And, and Scott, question. Do you think that sellers are going to then adjust their prices to be able to like, what's, it's kind of like, you know, pick, pick your poison, right? Do you let it sit there and pay the storage fee? Or do you take a little hit to that, to the price to get it out faster? Like what There's, are the strategies, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, pricing and, you know, are you going to be discounting your, pro your, your cost? But that's, that can have an overall impact. If you drop your prices to clear out inventory can bring on your overall price down, okay? And your average order value down, which is something you wanna be uh, concerned about. Um, and, but you do wanna be keeping an eye on how much are your stock or per SKU costing over time uh, to know, are you making actual profit, some sort of net margin after all these additional, your landed costs, plus these additional costs that are being added to those products that don't show up in the orders. When you place an order and you've got the Amazon marketplace fee, plus any FBA fees, plus any sponsored product ads, and then your piece is right here in the middle. And you got to make sure that that doesn't drop either below what you want to be making per sale or to the point where you're possibly losing money. And then you've got to decide, do you lose money on a sale or do you pay to have Amazon remove it to do something else with it? Absolutely. I think that makes sense. And it sounds like for me, this is a lot of like modeling out, right? Like modeling out different scenarios. Because even when folks talk about the inbound placement fee, do you send it to Amazon once and pay the premium fee? Do you do the legwork to be able to send it out to different you know, centers? What's the cost there? It seems like it really focuses around your core cost ROI, your COGS, right? Your COGS, landed goods, et cetera. And then what buffer do you have? Right. But like knowing your cogs is the first piece and knowing how much you can play within that is where everything else comes in. What decision is the right decision? Any decision that keeps you above your cogs. Yeah. Just the rule of thumb that I've been looking at, both from healthy businesses and having just a few set numbers so you can look at something. Um, and in general, for a new Amazon product, you want to be looking at something like a 60% gross margin, maybe even 65 or 70% because of all these additional fees and effort and time and, and different things that you have to go through. Hopefully to have a healthy net margin of, on Amazon of around 20% that ends up flowing through the rest of your financials so that you end up hopefully having a 15% or close to that EBITDA to have a healthy business. Like all of those things kind of kind of flow together, but it means like if you're looking at a product that has under a 50% gross margin, it's gonna be very hard, not quite impossible yet, to be able to make a profit, a net profit that you actually generate money even after all the work and your overhead and everything else of selling that product on Amazon. Really, really great benchmarks to have. I agree. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen. I just wanted to point out one thing about this uh, long-term storage fee. So previously, uh, the key fi <laughs> the fee kicked in at 365 days. It is now down to half a year. Okay, you guys. So again, um, know that these have, they have reduced, but they're also being enacted sooner rather than later. So just another thing to uh, keep in mind. Um, Denise, I see your question about seasonality. I definitely want to get to it. I want you to just real quickly tie in, amazing, another question. Uh, I want to quickly tie in what Scott was saying about benchmarks and keeping in mind kind of ROI, everything with advertising, right? So Liz, we talk about return on ad spend, but how does that ad spend then also factor into what is your overall profitability per SKU? Well, I think Scott can speak to this too, but generally, you you implement advertising and different advertising products on Amazon to increase sell through or to increase brand awareness. So obviously, if you're going to do sponsored product ads, that's to sell your actual products. That's the the lower funnel stuff. And when you've got that more more margin, you've got more runway. Then that's when you do brand awareness type things. But that is what a healthy business does. I see a lot of brands that are dumping money into ads without actually looking at their data and without actually knowing their cogs. <laughs> I mean, you kind of have to know your cogs first, like you said, Pauline, and then you plan everything else around that. So you've got to, you, advertising isn't its own thing. It's part sure, of sure. 
the entire picture of how your products are selling. And I mean, obviously, if you're having trouble selling through an item, you could reduce the price or you could increase advertising on it. You know, it just depends on the research you do. And, and it's all about making good decisions based on the data that you can uncover. And there's so many wonderful tools and available information out there, even on Amazon itself. Now, especially with all of the things that Amazon's introduced in terms of seeing the data regarding your products, your audience, the people that are looking at your at your products, especially if you're brand registered and all that kind of stuff. But it's it's all part of the bigger picture. But I do see a lot of people making really dumb decisions about advertising because they panic and they say, okay, great. Well, I'm just going to dump $1,000 a day into this one ASIN. And they're not even really looking at if that's actually getting them any return on their ad spend or not. So Perfect. I was about to ask, what do you think is the more important metric, ACOS or ROAS? And again, so that is um, advertising, advertising cost of sale or total advertising cost of sale, as take metrics like to say, to keep on top, top of your tacos. The the advertising person that I used to be would say tacos is more important, but thinking from a seller perspective, I would think that the return on your ad spend would have to be if you're thinking about a healthy business and you're thinking about profitability, that needs to be a metric that you pay very close attention to. And I'll I, fight you. For free. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> we're lovers, not fighters here. Yes, exactly. Okay. Great, great, great. Um, all right, Denise. So let's see your first question. How do you manage seasonal product to have enough for the holiday season, but then not end up with inventory after the holiday? and then recall and or dispose. So for us, and again, you guys, if you've been on a web webinar with me, you know that I have to mention data at least a hundred times. So for me, this always comes down to the data, okay? Yes, we will have, um, you, you have the ability to look back at your trends this year, your past 30, 60, 90, sure. You know what advertising plans you may have coming up to kind of give that a boost, but you also have, you also really should have access to your last year sales history, okay? And so while even if it's not you know, readily available, some systems have it more than others, being able to look back at what happened, honestly, October week one. I know a lot of businesses who predicate their Q4 based literally on October week one, based on how October week one trends against the rest of the 30, 60, 90, they make their Q4 plans off of that one week right, alone, or even another time period. But my point is, factor in last year while also taking into consideration this year. Um, the other thing I wanna say about, you know, um, again, I'm, I'm just gonna bring up, you know, these new fees, the storage fees for Amazon, even though uh, there are storage fees that we'll kick into another later, a lot of sellers this year are talking about getting their Q4 inventory into Amazon. Um, sooner rather than later. They want to take the fee hit because they want to make sure that their products are in Amazon before everyone else's and not, you know, go up against a, a capacity issue. So again, you talk about, you know, what's really possible within this margin, Denise, you know, uh, per Scott, 25, you know, 30%, that kind of area. It's kind of figuring out where and how can you make these moves, take these hits, et cetera. Um, yeah. anyone have any, any other perspectives on that seasonality? My, the, you, you actually have to plan it even more carefully than people have ongoing product sales. Uh, what you want in my recommendation is either on your own or primarily working with the right role is a e-commerce specific who understands Amazon e-commerce, uh, fractional or virtual, you know, CFO will build out models that will total up those costs to say, okay, here are the costs now with all the new fees of here's how much cost you, if you do ship it in early, how do you stage a certain amount? So, you you know, are you starting through a staging warehouse or AWD to fill those in? And then to pre-map out what your decision is before you send out inventory, whether or not you're going to uh, let it ride and pay fees, and hope people pick stuff up, you're going to discount it or you're going to remove or dispose it. But if people don't know, you always want to be careful with Amazon disposals. 
They don't incinerate things. They don't just disappear and go into the dimension where your socks go. Those products go into a shipping container, sight unseen, other people buy them, they'll have your product and they can sell against your own ASINs. So most sellers, the vast majority of our sellers that don't want product to be sold, remove it, but you want to keep an eye on and plan ahead for those fees. So that, so everything that Pauline said, you want to model, but if you're like, I can't map it, I'm not great in Excel, or even if you are, that's exactly, I can help validate the data and validate things and provide best practices and, and kind of common sense. But the person you want to hire for a project, and I would say spending a few thousand dollars for someone to build you these models could save you tens of thousand of dollars of fees and everything else. So that's my two cents. Really interesting. Yeah. So we've kind of been taking a stance of, you know, how do we kind of manage around what about directly with, with Amazon? So Scott, you just talked about getting your products back from Amazon, but Lisa, there's also a component of profitability that, that involves actual re revenue and getting your money back from Amazon. Let's talk about that. So yeah. this is a new thing that Amazon sellers are contending with, but this is a real big thing that Amazon sellers continue to manage and deal with. So um, again, what are we telling sellers? How can they actually go about adding more, adding more bucks to the bank? Yeah, for sure. And I do have to say real quick, Scott, when I first joined the e-commerce world by way of supply chain and I heard about product, you know, either remove or destroy, I did think everything went into an incinerator very ignorantly. And I was like, oh, wow, that's so wasteful. Why would they do that? And now that I know better, it's like, oh, please, please place a removal order, get your product back. And even just in that example, you know, exactly. There, There's money on the table sometimes for sellers. If you have ever placed a removal order with Amazon and you got back not all the quantity that you had requested, or you got a portion of it that was a different ASIN, which of course is now not an inventory and you can't sell, there is a reimbursement type that you can file with Amazon to get your money back. Anytime there's an issue with your inventory in Amazon, you have money due back to you because that's inventory that you can't sell. It's either incorrectly charged fees. When we were looking at the spreadsheet earlier of the fees per the weight of the item, if your product goes through the ASIN one time and the Cuba scanner gets it wrong, guess what? That's the weights and dimensions slapped onto that ASIN throughout their whole whole system. So you have to be on top of it. It's like you said, Pauline, know the data. And, and you're right. We had you on a podcast recently and every answer was like, well, if you take a look at the data, well, the data, this, you know, um, sorry, you do have to be, you have to know every single number in, in your business. And when we're talking about, okay, increasing the cost of the product to make up margin, or maybe if we, we, you know, trim down the advertising a little bit, a great first place to start is just looking through your account for any of these reimbursement opportunities, because that's immediate cash that you can put back into your pocket. You can reinvest into advertising. You can reinvest into your stock, right? So you don't go out of stock. Um, I, conversations like this make me even less envious of our Amazon sellers than before, because it's already like spinning a bunch of plates and, oh, guess what? Now the floor is lava. So like it's, it's already so much to handle. So y'all please continue to use the, the questions and, and the comments here. Um, but yeah, it's I, I, any questions anybody has about reimbursements or where to start specifically, let me know, but look at your account, identify any discrepancies when you're shipping in inventory. If you're placing a removal order, like I mentioned before, be sure you're getting all that you can. Weights and dimensions is huge. And it's just one to 3%. You can add right back to the bottom line to help you throughout this this holiday season cuz already it's april probably start planning for q4 and q2 like <laughs> exactly exactly and, and the 1 to 3% sounds like a small number but 1 to 3% at the volume these sellers are at is significant so i 3% back for sure so yeah. uh, okay great so i mean lisa you talk i mean you and i talk we talk data all the time we talk about there's so many things to keep on top of they're in different places and teams are only so big and teams are only so capable, right? They're really busy. They're actually pushing out the product. They're working with their suppliers. Great listing optimization, amazing advertising, cool. But Liz, like how are these teams actually managing all of this to get it done, to find out the information 
to, um, again, to manage the overall company, which is not just around product and inventory, but again, it's all of the other pieces too. What should they be doing? When should they be doing it? How should they be doing it? With who should they be doing it? Influencers, advertising. Like, again, I can, I can put up the, the slide at the beginning where it's just a word cloud of all the things. Like, how are people managing all the things? Well, I mean, <clears throat> there's a reason that we're all here, right? The service provider side of e-commerce is almost as big as the seller side of e-commerce. And it has been since this all started. And watching through the years, all the softwares that have been available, all the different services that have been, you know, like Pauline, actually all of us have been around for a really long time and have seen the trends that have come. We've seen big trends happen and then fade away. But what these businesses are doing right are choosing partners and softwares and solutions that are enhancing their operational efficiency, that are helping them understand their data better so that they can make better decisions. And they're choosing partners that can help connect them with other service providers and solutions that all weave into that operational excellence that's needed for a healthy business. The Do you problem see, like sellers at different stage focusing on different areas of help. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, people that are at a certain level are just getting started or they're just, this is a side business for them, or they're doing more of the, the private label modification of a product rather than a brand. They're going to focus on pricing. They're going to focus on, the getting the baseline out there, they're going to only do sponsor product ads. They're going to, you know, worry about inventory. They're going to worry about competition. They're going to worry about that kind of stuff. And then people who are launching brands are going to have different focuses. They want brand exposure. They want to take advantage of all the brand registry benefits. They want to do brand awareness type advertising. I mean, at every stage at every level, there are different areas to be the most concerned about at that moment. But there are also all these people out there that are saying, I am the solution that you should choose and you should pay me this much money to solve this problem for you. And people can get really, really super confused. I mean, I rem there are far less bad actors today than there were in like 2014, 2015, when guys were getting arrested for selling $35,000 worth of defective product to people and that kind of stuff. And I won't name any names, but I think the people in this room <laughs> know who I'm talking about, but I still see ads on Facebook for people saying, I sell this cooler bag on Amazon and I make $10,000 a month. You know, I mean, I still see, um, I still see ads like that trying to hook people in. And there are still people out there that say, wait, I could sell on Amazon just like I did in 2014, you know, Holy it's, it's still not, I mean, I, I live in an area of the country where there are not a lot of e-commerce professionals. And when I tell people what I do, I, you know, I'm pretty exact about it. I've got it down to like exactly 15 seconds of explaining what I do. And then they say, oh, you work at Amazon. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't. Same. So there, there's a lot that people don't know, but the people that are just getting into selling and just getting into or just getting into Amazon say they've been doing brick and mortar this whole time saying they've been doing DTC the whole time the Amazon's a whole different world and there are so many service providers out there that want the same subset of people who are selling on Amazon that they're if they google they're going to see all kinds of stuff it's really my point is it's really important to choose your partners wisely yeah, it's really I mean so pay attention to thought leadership, listen to free content, make your decisions based on who can really help you solve your problems. Definitely. We've been talking about this margin, right? Um, how are these sellers fitting into that margin and how are they proving their value above and beyond their cost? Because I know that some of these agencies can be expensive, but if they're able to do what, is it worth it? Yeah, the tough part about, I mean, agencies in a lot of cases are a bad word. <laughs> um, 
there is very little trust in agencies out there and it's it's very very challenging i spent a lot of time working with high seven figures eight figure sellers and uh unfortunately it is it's something that everybody should be cautious about that you really do need if you're if you become an entrepreneur and you've decided to sell stuff and you have products up on amazon you you one of your responsibilities is to really understand this and even if it's not your main focus, if you're really great at marketing or product design or whatever else, really it comes down to you really have to understand and own your own marketing and know, understand your numbers and understand your ROAS and understand those key things and have those numbers um, and manage it very, very carefully, just like you manage cash flow, you know, in your business and everything else um, before you think, hey, I'm going to hire an agency because they'll just burn up money. OK, uh, one of the key things you should sit down with your accountant or look at your books and just say, look, I have this much money. This is it. This is the budget. I can't spend any more than that. Otherwise, I can't afford to buy more inventory or I won't pull any money out of the business or all the other pieces that are there that it, it really, you know, if you speak EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System, it can be a multi-quarter rock or goal to really understand advertising and control it and just set yourself like a really harsh limit of a budget and do the most with it and increment it. Now, if you get to the point where you're really good, you're either gonna be so good, you don't have to hire anybody and give them any of that money, okay? Or you're going to know how to interview an agency and then you're just gonna give them a teeny bit of money and a little bit of a leash and a little bit more. And if they don't perform, fire them fast. Fa I would fire agencies faster than you fire bad employees. So That's fair, I like that. And I'm really looking at contract terms, right? Like what does it take to end the contract? I agree with you there, yeah. So kind of in the same way that I asked Liz about, you know, what are people looking for when they first get started versus as a more advanced? For Finale, it's we want to prevent overselling, right? We've got you covered, real-time things cool. As we're with our users longer, they want efficiency, the profitability, enhanced reporting, and then comes like barcoding and API exports, great. But from the agency side, I would imagine it's kind of like when you first get started, you want to be able to optimize your listings perhaps, right? But then as you're a more experienced seller, then you're getting into, yes, I agree. Nita, absolutely. You all the way, optimizing advertising, optimizing your financials, really getting into um, like the bookkeeping side of it. That's just kind of me uh, pontificating, so. <laughs> no, I mean, I, for me, running an, you know cloud accounting services businesses for 12, 13 years, yeah, it gets down to everyone has to understand you are a business, even if it's a side gig and you're just throwing some money, you need to be tracking your costs because if you're not looking at all the different things um, and there's just a number of best practices there, but you really do have to accept that you're a business and that your bookkeeping and financials are really critical to your success to tell you whether or not you're making money or not. And it can provide so much feedback. Um, there's just a number of key tips. You know, one of the key things is to make sure that there are some really nice Amazon tools out there that will give you an Amazon profit and loss statement. Okay. It's kind of a real time and people assume that that gives you some real time data and it does. You can make some great real time data. They expose a lot of these fees to you on a daily basis. You can see something changing and make those like point decisions but that's not accounting and bookkeeping. You have to have a separate general ledger like Xero or QuickBooks Online where all of that data is flowing down and it's being reconciled, okay? Which means you actually check the what the account, the, the data online says to your bank statement. And if it's off by $50,000, one way or the other, the bank wins if you can't challenge it or catch it fast enough. So this, this process of going through double entry accounting. Now keep in mind, I'm married to an accountant. I'm not an accountant. I can talk about a lot of this. And, and my partner was my wife who, who's, who's an amazing accountant. Because what you wanna get for an e-commerce business is you wanna have a balance sheet. And a balance sheet holds those things of value, like the inventory that you haven't sold. If you spend a million dollars in inventory and you haven't sold any of it, you should have a million dollars on your balance sheet. As you sell, it reduces. And those two things work together to make sure you understand the health of your business and how things are going. If you don't know anything about it, they're, Catching Clouds was the first e-commerce accounting practice. There are now dozens and dozens that work with all sizes of sellers 
for accountants that only work with e-commerce businesses. So they know what FBA is, they understand the fees, they understand the impacts, they understand sales tax and all these other impacts. Uh, but the same thing as a marketing agency, you want to understand enough about your bookkeeping and you probably did it while you were smaller before you could afford to hire an offshore bookkeeper or a company that does it. But it is just critical to your business to understand these things and that really your accounting is really only done once a month when you've closed the prior month's book. It's not a real-time thing. You have real-time tools to make real-time decisions. And then monthly you stop and pause and look at your financials and understand what happened in the prior month. So those are some of the basics that I see a lot of people trip up on is they're not paying enough attention to themselves as a business. And what do I have to do to run my business? Not just, I am so busy chasing all the changes at Amazon or supply chain yeah. issues. Right, right. I, I think that's another thing. I like that you speak to, yeah, that there are things that will pop up all the time and there's like shiny new things. Maybe the Amazon fees are not so shiny. Maybe they're more of like a pain in our somewhere else. But um, new things pop up, but really like long-term resiliency, I think is the right message that we should have for our sellers here. Our larger sellers who are going to weather the storm and not going to worry about these little things that pop up. Find a solution for them, but you know, they're, they're going to carry through. Um, Scott, you had mentioned a million dollars in inventory. That kind of made me think, do you have a stance on getting funding for inventory, right? There are these separate agencies uh. so there that will kind of front money for I will take the sigh as a you do have a stance well yeah it's uh, I'm uh, the best business even though it's harder and it takes longer is a bootstrapped business that's profitable that's putting enough money of profit each month so that you can take a portion of that so let's say the, the optimal goal of healthy business is a 15 percent EBITDA or you know net net profit Okay, just simple numbers. Okay, then you can take two thirds of that and invest it back in the business in additional inventory. So if you're not generating cash flow, I mean, that is the best approach is, you know, if you're bootstrapping it and you don't want to go, oh, I didn't pay attention to this cost or these fees, or I forgot that I had a $50,000, you know, dollar container of inventory showing up and I spent all the money on advertising. Now I've got to go borrow from friends or family or from a bank or a credit line or whatever else. Now, if you have something that's going and you understand that you, you're doing well and now you're like, hey, things are moving forward. Now I need additional capital to keep up with the growth. I'm still profitable, but I still need to do it. You have a number of different choices. The best money is uh, an SBA loan. If you can qualify for an SBA loan, it is the best, most affordable uh, you know, interest rate loan to get you a chunk of money and then you manage against that. Then there are multiple different inventory-based tools. There are tools that are uh, that will let you factor. What like, hey, I, you know, I spent a hundred thousand dollars on this inventory. I've got this invoice, and I'm going to pay it over time, and I pay a little bit of interest. But anytime you're paying all of this interest, it's just like all these nag nagging Amazon fees. If you don't keep an eye on all these additional costs and overhead versus just paying straight cash, you just have to be concerned. So you want to first talk to your accountant, bookkeeper, not necessarily your income tax CPA to say, hey, what's going on in my books? You know, how do, how do I look? And having solid books, you can take them to a bank or somebody else to get a loan. Um, and then if you're truly unsure and you need help getting financial, that's another thing that a fractional CFO really digs in or your accounting firm, your e-commerce accounting firm will rate them and help you navigate which of these different tools. And you want to avoid things like Shopify's capital loans or Amazon's can stopping their capital loans. Those were always bad. They were very, very expensive. You want to be very careful. It is just like getting a current credit card and getting behind and you go from an introductory rate of 0% or very low to 20, 30, 80, 100%. I mean, keep in mind, some of these online uh, inventory financing, capital financing for e-commerce businesses and whatever else, old day loan sharks would, would have never dreamed of getting the kind of percentage and money back on them that you can. So you just want to be cautious about it. Ask either peers in a mastermind, find a fractional CFO, find an advisor that can help guide you through to get the right capital. Nice. Yeah. I remember that APR conversation literally being like, 
my 17th birthday, right? Before I get the credit card and go off to college, mom was like, Pauline, you have to know that this is exponential. And I'm like, oh God, okay. It's been drilled in my head. So, um, okay, great. You did mention though, Shopify and growth. And so I know that we are very much here to talk about Amazon, uh, but I also know that there's a big overlap between Amazon sellers and really multi-channel sellers, Shopify web store, and even in-store pieces. And so for me, you know, I think that that's something that I really believe in. Uh, we talk about resilient businesses and that multi-channel piece is really, I believe how businesses become resilient, Resi um, expanding channels, right? Being able to rely on multiple revenue streams. So you have economies of scale, you have your team, you have your products, you have your warehouse, send it to another channel. Whether you're starting on a web store or, and then expanding to marketplace, vice versa, I know is kind of a trickier route somehow, but um, also easier. I think that the, you know how you learn about like English and, I'm sorry, French and Spanish in high school and you start Spanish and it's like, oh, Spanish is easy to get started and then hard in the long term and French is harder to get started and easier in the long term. I kind of feel like that's how it is between web store to Amazon and Amazon to web store. But um, in any case, I digress. My, my point is diversification, expansion, growth. Uh, by multiple channels, multiple means of advertising streams, even, you know, understanding your suppliers. But um, you guys also, any other thoughts on growth? Oh, Denise, Denise, girl, I love you. Thanks for the questions. What is the best additional marketplace for home goods products? Um, I think it depends a lot on the size of your products. Are we selling decor? Are we selling furniture, right? Um, larger sites like Wayfair, Overstock, et cetera, very much um, you know, leading towards the furniture side. There are also places that you can smell, sell your smaller like home decor goods, obviously there as well. Um, but I think that's where you can also get into like, um, Haystack, there's also, um, uh, did you think shops. You? sorry, say that again. TikTok, sh TikTok shops for smaller. Yeah. How can I forget about TikTok shops? Yes. Thank you for sure. Right. TikTok shops is known for this kind of like under 30 mark, which is also, by the way, where Amazon sellers are not doing well is this kind of like low bar, uh, low average cost per good. But TikTok shops is absolutely the place to go. Thank you, Liz. For I have got many under $30 home decor items from TikTok shops. Yeah. Fast finds. TikTok is all about fast finds. No, that's great. Uh, Pauline, on, on your question, I mean, the thing about going from Amazon, which I don't know, Liz, what do you think? I think it's 10 to 15 times harder than it was in 2011, you know, mid than it was before. But the key things for expanding to a shopping cart um, is that you own the customer, you get the email, okay? You get the email address, you can market, you can market to them again, you can you know, increase the lifetime value, you can send discounts and grow that audience. And then just pure financial, just because of the marketplace fee compared to what you're gonna pay for shop pay or any of the other payment options. And you can offer a range of these, including you know, delayed payment options like a firm or after pay or whatever, is you make 10 to 12%, depending on the category, more on every sale that you make. Even if you fulfill it all, all out of FBA, which you can do, you make more money and then you can market to them. Then you can do email marketing. Then you can do SMS marketing. Um, you can continue to own your brand. Um, there's less of Amazon capriciously suspending accounts just because they've guided things better, but it can still happen and you can have all your revenue uh, shut off. But uh, it is a different piece, but in some ways it's, um, you know, and a lot of people do, uh, most of the sellers I work with do a combination. Some people are mostly Amazon. Some people are mostly Shopify and a little bit of Amazon that they do certain things for. Um, but you really want to make that decision. And then, then, like you said, you've got options. If you want to go a little bit B2B, you can go to fair, you can go to another marketplace and expand. Um, but in the in the time, in the all the different hundreds, thousands of companies I've looked at and talked at, the shotgun approach does not work. You just spend your time and money across everything else. Pick two or three and really focus in on those. Um, I've had sellers come to me in 20, you know, marketplaces where they're just trying everything and working very, very hard for no money. And I'm like, get rid of 10 and then I'll clean up your books and then you'll get rid of 50% of those because we'll show that they're not profitable. I think that's a great point to make. It's all about focus and 
uh, depth, not breadth, right? Your team yeah. is going to exhaust themselves worrying about all the listings on the various channels. The Again, we talk about sales loss and Amazon alone. Try to figure out your sales loss across everything, right? Uh, without a tool like Finale or something else to kind of catch all of that. Um, great. You, oh, Scott, you just mentioned something. Oh, you talked about branding. I agree. Yes, your web store is how you're going to be able to own own the customer, own their information, have more margin, ding, ding, margin. Um, but going back to Amazon fees, guys, I have like Amazon fees on the brain. Ships and packaging, right? Your own branded branded box. How do we feel about this? There are pros and cons across, across the board. I think it's a real opportunity if you've yeah. got great packaging to not cover that packaging with a big thing with Amazon tape on it. I mean, I think it's got, but with obviously with items that need a little bit more, or if you've got poly bag, I mean, I actually got a pair of jeans delivered to me with a, in a poly bag with the label on them. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, there they are, everybody. Can, and it can be bad if you're buying gifts. Cause I have a cousin that ordered a toy for her son for Christmas and it came shipping in its own container. So he knew that Santa yeah. Claus didn't bring that toy. He's only four. So that was some um, fast talking on the whole family's part. But I think that, I mean, the money that it can save and the additional branding it can promote is it's more positive than it is negative. And let's not also forget that versus 2011, 2014, the branding opportunities on Amazon itself are so much better than they used to be. And Amazon has done a lot to help you amplify your brand, to to put badges on, you know, you know small business badges and the, all the brand registry stuff. And it's so much better than it used to be. So yes, there are more fees. Yes, it's harder there aren't the arbitrary like mass amounts of suspensions, but incorrect suspensions still happen. It's not perfect, but it's this enormous thing that has never existed before, right? We talk about Walmart and we talk about how the digital shelf at Walmart is different than actually walking into a Walmart store. Amazon has always been a digital store. It's always been digital shelf. It's always been it's never been in person. It's never, it's just always existed in our imaginations, right? When you build something like that brand new that the world has never seen, it's going to have some kinks and it's going to have some problems. But I think that they've done a lot to increase a brand's opportunity um, in the last few years. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And talking, sorry, Pauline, just jump in really quick and talking too about the badges that you mentioned, Liz, the client friendly badge or client Climate friendly badge is something I've been hearing a lot about lately. That's obviously catering to a very specific type of consumer. And it it gives a bad taste in your mouth when you purchase this eco-friendly, climate-friendly product that is then in an Amazon box this big that you have to figure out what to do with when the product is this big. Like, you know, so it it can help you reinforce that that trust and that credibility with the customer so that whenever you do have extended product lines on either, you know, your Shopify store or wherever, and you say, Hey, also come shop over here. Then they know that they're going to get the same experience that aligns with their core values. That's a great point. hundred percent. Yeah. So I'm definitely on team, uh, ships and product packaging is a good thing. It may be an inconvenience notably, but I think long-term it's a benefit. Um, and, uh, obviously Denise, yes, kind of Enrolling products when you don't want them to be, kind of deciding when you do and don't want is something that we'll have to, again, finesse here. Um, but I think long-term, it's it's a benefit for the brand. So um, I'm putting this slide up as just kind of a like last call flash of the lights for your questions to get them in. Uh, it also shows how to get in touch with everyone here on the panel today. And while I can just kill some airtime while we see if anyone else has questions, just want to say that Finale does have an, an awesome offer for new sellers. Uh, you guys, we just fully revamped our, uh, our FBA uh, kind of visibility platform. By that, I mean, we are making sure that the data that reflects in Amazon is exactly how it shows in your Finale account in terms of 
finding out of hand, orders received, kind of working through the whole transfer orders and what's been accepted by Amazon. Uh, so check that out. Talk to the Finale team. And if you give them this code here, uh, AMZ24, you'll actually get free Amazon orders for the month of July. Friends, check it. Yes, we mean Prime Month free Amazon orders. Tell your friends. So um, with that, any other uh, last questions from the crew here? I will do my own plug and say that the Ecom Cooperative is free for any seller, brand owner, or merchant to join. And we will help connect you with people like this that will help you solve your problems. So all you have to do is go to the Ecom Cooperative cooperative.com and sign up and you will be part of our community and we will be your best friend. Also affectionately abbreviated as Tico and they have dinners in the New York tri-state area a lot. So if you guys are local to there, please go see the teams. <laughs> Shameless plug as well because Katita is part of Tico. <laughs> yes. That's, great. All that's very cool. All right. Everyone, I think that's a wrap then. And for anyone out there who does have a question, again, please get a hold of us. We're here. Uh, there should also be something in the chat that's coming. Perfect. So if you want to specifically talk to any one of us here, uh, fill up the form. We'll make sure that your information gets directly to whoever you want to talk to. We will send that out. Uh, we'll put that in the follow-up notes. Uh, again, check out the chat. Otherwise, it really has been a pleasure to, to speak with everyone. I hope, again, you guys have walked away with a few learnings here. And uh, yeah, let's all keep in touch. Happy selling and uh, happy hump day, y'all. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Take care.